Okay, I got two thumbs up, so we're going to go ahead. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight, and welcome to this September edition of Waxing Clinical. Um, we're looking forward to another wonderful session today with one of our esteemed and care clinicians who's going to be presenting on the topic of an update to stroke care. Uh, joining us today and presenting will be Dr. Bongani Ngele. Dr. Bongani Ngele is an ambitious and hardworking neurologist who strives to teach all all his patients holistically. Um, in 2015, uh, Dr. Ngele graduated from the University of Wits and then later received a diploma in HIV management um, from the College of Medicine. Um, and then in 2023, he completed his MMed, um, specializing in neurology from the University of Pretoria and completed his fellowship through the College of Neurologists um, gaining his qualification as a neurologist through the College of Medicine of South Africa. Um, in addition, he's also completed a seven-month interactive electroencephalography distance learning program through the Neurological Association of South Africa and the University of Cape Town. Um, Dr. Ngile did his internship uh, in Limpopo and also completed his community service um, at Jane First Hospital in Limpopo. Dr. Ngile is a specialist neurologist um, who treats uncontrollable headaches, memory loss, uh, cognitive impairments, numbness, nerve pain, and neurological disorders. Um, and he is based out of Medcare Sunning Hill Hospital. Um, so I note the comment here that there is no sound. I just want to confirm, is this for everyone or... Uh, can someone just confirm for me if you're able to hear me or not? I can hear you clearly, yeah, but see, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So just if it, if there's no sound on your end, I would just suggest logging out and logging back in. It might be um, just uh, an internet issue. But without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Ngele, um, who is going to take us through a pragmatic update to the management of stroke. Um, let me just pull up his slides. If you give me one second. And then we'll be able to see that. Okay. Finally. Okay, there we go. All right, Dr. Ngele, you can take it away. All right, th thank you. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as I've already been introduced, I'm Dr. Bongalinge. I'm a specialist neurologist currently practicing in, at Netcare Sunning Hill Hospital. So just to start things off, every 40 seconds, someone in the world experiences a stroke. In the next 45 minutes, while we're discussing acute stroke treatment, over 65 people will have their lives permanently changed by this medical emergency. Now let's talk about how we can change those numbers. Now that we understand the agency and the impact of what we are dealing with, let's delve into how we can better equip ourselves for the challenges and opportunities in the treatment of acute stroke. So prepare for an engaging journey that I hope will enrich your clinical practice. Next slide. Before we dive into our discussion, I'd like to make a disclosure. I have received no sponsorship or funding, and I'm not under any influence from any pharmaceutical or medical device company in relation to this presentation. And in medical education, it's important to ensure transparency. And I want to assure you that the content and views presented in this talk are entirely my own and do not represent those of any other entity or third party. All research studies and clinical trials referenced in this presentation are publicly available and have undergone rigorous peer review. If there are any concerns or questions about this disclosure, I welcome you to bring them up in the Q&A session at the end of this presentation. Next slide. So Dr. L.K. Jones, Jr., a renowned expert and editor-in-chief of American Academy of Neurology, talks about how stroke care has changed a lot. It's not the third biggest killer in the US anymore. It's actually now the fifth. This shows we've made some good progress. We've got better ways to diagnose and treat strokes now. And lots of new technology to help us. But with all these new treatments and procedures, 
we are now facing a different problem. We need more resources. We need more people and more time to do all these things for our stroke patients. And there's a lot of research happening too, which shows how much we are learning and growing in this field. So while stroke can be devastating, we're making big strides in understanding and treating it. Next slide. So as we delve into today's presentation, it's important to know that uh, we, are make, uh, we are aiming to achieve. Here are the key objectives that will guide our exploration of stroke care. First, we'll take a look at the most recent advancement in acute stroke treatment. This will include what's new, what's improved, and what's coming, what, what's upcoming in the field. Next, we'll discuss a pragmatic approach to the diagnosis and management of acute stroke. The, the focus will be an, on actionable insights that can be readily implemented in clinical setting. We will also discuss some of the unique challenges and opportunities in treating stroke within our healthcare system here in South Africa. Now that we are clear on what we are aiming to cover today, let's begin by understanding the scale and impact of stroke, setting the stage for all the specifics to follow. Next slide. So the statistics surrounding strokes are sobering to say the, to say the least and they lay the foundation for the agency with which we need to approach acute stroke care. Let's delve into some numbers. So globally, stroke accounts for nearly 6 million deaths annually, making it the second leading cause of death worldwide. Furthermore, stroke is the third leading cause of disability globally as per World Health Organization. In South Africa, stroke accounts for an estimated 4 to 5% of all deaths, with the incident rate being as high as 316 per 100,000 population. These are, these are, are not just numbers, they are lives and families impacted. Although stroke is often associated with older age, recent studies indicate that up to 10% of all stroke, strokes occur in people younger than 50. This rise in incidents among younger demographics is actually concerning. So the economic burden of stroke is also substantial. Estimated to be in the billions of rands annually in South Africa, mainly due to hospitalizations and long-term care. So with these staggering statistics as our, um, as our backdrop, the need for an effective and efficient approach to acute stroke treatment becomes glaringly clear. Let's now move on to understanding the types of strokes, just basics on it, and specific uh, treatment guidelines. Next slide. So as we delve into the crux of today's discussion, it's essential to understand that not all strokes are the same. So fund fundamentally, there are two main types. There's the ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes. The nature of each has profound implications on diagnosis and treatment. So making up about 85% of all strokes, ischemic strokes occur where there is an obstruction in a blood vessel supplying to the brain. They're generally categorized into thrombotic and embolic strokes, although less frequent, making up approximately 15% of stroke cases. Hemorrhagic strokes occur due to ruptured blood vessel in the brain. This type can be further classified into intracerebral and subarachnoid hemorrhage. However, in this talk, uh, the focus will be on ischemic stroke. Next slide. So as we talk about stroke, it's crucial that we understand how to recognize one as early as possible. This is the way FAST acronym um, comes into play. It's a simple and effective tool to help detect and respond to a person having a stroke, which then the F stands for face, for instance, if you ask the, the person to smile, check if one side of the face droops. A stands for arms. So upon asking the person to raise both arms, observe if one arm drifts, drifts to, uh, downward. And then the S stands for speech. So when asking the person to repeat a simple phrase, listen to see if their speech is slurred or strange. Finally, T, which stands for time. So if you observe any of these signs, it's time to call 911. Remember, early recognition and response can make a significant difference in the treatment outcomes of a stroke. 
The sooner a stroke is treated, the better the prognosis. So, um, so diagnosis um, actually forms the cornerstone of effective stroke management, and it's an area teeming with innovation and new insights. Let's examine some of the key diagnostic tools underscored by recent scientific literature. So CT scans often serve as the first line diag diagnostic tool. Recent studies have pointed to the utility of high resolution CT scans in detecting finer ischemic regions often missed by traditional methods. An increasingly significant tool is the CT perfusion which provides real-time dynamic imaging of the cerebral, cerebral blood flow. So a 2022 study in Radiology Journal indicates that CT perfusion can help identify salvageable brain tissue in, in forming more uh, targeted intervention. MRI, particularly diffusion-weighted imaging, that is the DWI, remains a crucial tool for early detection of ischemic strokes. So a study uh, from the Stroke Journal found that it increased diagnostic accuracy by up to 20%. So in terms of serology or rather the blood tests, while not definitive, however, they provide valuable ancillary information. Uh, biomarkers such as glial fibrillary acidic protein, GFEP, have shown promise in differentiating stroke mimics as reported in a 2021 Lancet Neurology article. Other uh, techniques like carotid ultrasound and cerebral angiography remain important, especially for complex cases requiring in-depth vascular assessment as highlighted in recent publication in uh, Neuroimaging Clinics Journal. So armed with these diagnostic tools and the latest research, we are in strong position to make timely and effective treatment decision. Uh, now let's examine how these tools inform our approach to treatment. Um, we, can keep, we can skip the ne next slide and let's just move to the slide on acute stroke treatment. So as, as we hone in on ischemic stroke treatment, it's crucial to understand that immediate and effective intervention can significantly imp improve patient's outcome. So our discussion will focus on two pillars of, of um, acute ischemic stroke management. So that is the thrombolytic therapy and the mechanical thrombectomy. Both of these... Sorry? No, no, don't worry about that. I'm, I'm mute. You can continue. Shall I continue? Okay. Okay, so, so both of these treatments, uh, the thrombolytic therapy and mechanical thrombectomy, have undergone considerable scrutiny, scrutiny and innovation in recent years. And we'll be delving into the nitty gritty details, including the latest research uh, in the slides to come. So these slides basically just highlights the, um, the eligibility criteria of the tissue plasminogen activator. So this is South Africa in contrast to the American Heart Association guideline from 2019 um, and the FDA, which basically looks, uh, um, here I've just highlighted the just a few commonest um, contraindications and indications. So in South Africa, we give a lytic therapy, uh, regardless of how disabling the stroke is. So meaning an NIHSS score of less than six or even beyond 12, we still give the lytic therapy because recent studies have actually shown benefit in, in the group below six and above 12. So um, with the symptoms onset within four and a half hours, in, uh, in South Africa, a AHA and FDA, um, it approves for use. However, only with FDA, actually, the cutoff is three hours, below three hours. And um, the other one is the wake-up stroke, uh, which then you can do the DWI flare mismatch. Even the CT perfusion actually can be beneficial. Uh, any age, uh, although AHA um, from 2019, actually, below the age of um, yeah. 18, uh, still not doesn't recommend giving lytic therapy. 
Uh, patients with severe head trauma less than three months, we don't give uh, ischemic stroke uh, less than three months, we do give. BPs above 185, 110, do not give. INR of above 127, do not give. And also ICH. Let's move to the next slide. So building on that foundation, let's turn back the clock and um, explore the key milestones that have shaped thrombolytic therapy for ischemic strokes. So understanding this uh, history not only enlightens us about our past, but also equips us to better appreciate and evaluate current and future innovations. So in the 1950s and the 1960s, early thrombolytic agents like streptokinase and neurokinase were introduced while they represented a leap in acute stroke care, they came with their own set of challenges, including a lack of specificity and a significant risk for hemorrhagic complications. However, by the late 80s, researchers were actively using animal models to investigate these agents, as well as the ideal therapeutic window for treatment. This research ha has paved the way for the human trials that will follow and form the bedrock of our modern understanding. Then came the mid 90s, a pivotal moment in the history of stroke treatment. So the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Strokes, also known as the NINS, published a groundbreaking study in 1995 that validated the effectiveness of Altiplase, commonly known as the TPA or tissue plasminogen activator. This was not just another research paper. It re revolutionized acute stroke care and led to FDA approval the following year. Fast forward to the late 2000s, and we see yet another significant paradigm shift. The ECOS-3 trial in 2008 showed that the therapeutic window for administ administering TPA could be ex expanded to four and a half hours. This research paved the way for treating a broader range of patients, including those with wake-up strokes. In the 2010s, our collective gaze turned towards refinement. Studies be uh, began to emerge that compared the safety and efficacy of TPA with newer agents like tenecteplase. These investigations led us to question and reassess our dosing strategies timing considerations and criteria for patient selection. So as we navigate through the current best practices and groundbreaking, groundbreaking research in the slides that follow, keep this historical journey in the back of your mind. It serves as a testament to the innovation and adaptab adapt adaptability that characterize our field. Now let's delve into the state of the art developments that are defining the future of stroke care. But before that, just a quick revision on guidelines for safe and effective administration of um, alteplase. So very key to um, do patient selection. So this is to rule out any contraindications, see which patient is eligible for therapy. And then you do dosing. Uh, the, our current dosing uh, um, uh, protocol is 0 0.9 milligram per kilogram with a maximum dose of 90 milligram. And you give the 10% of the dose as a bolus over one minute, and the remainder is infused over 60 minutes. Um, and then subsequently you do monitoring, you monitor vitals every 15 minutes during infusion, every 30 minutes for the next six hours, and then hourly for the, uh, uh, up until 24 hours. So regular neurological assessments are very uh, important and be vigilant for bleeding uh, complications. And then subsequently later on within 24 hours, you do a non-contrasted CT uh, head or you can do an MRI. Um, so as we've seen, um, the advancements in thrombolytic therapy have been transformative. However, these therapies are not without challenges, particularly when it comes to patient selection and potential complications. So, a very, very key thing that you need to remember is to consider the NIH as a score. Ideally, be done when you see the patient for the first time and then subsequent days. So, a higher score on the NIH as a score usually indicates a more favorable cost effective ratio for the therapy. Time since onset remains a crucial factor. But as we've seen, newer studies are expanding these limits. And of course, we must consider contraindications 
uh, which I've mentioned on the previous slide. So turning our attention to complications. So in symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage is the most feared, occurring in approximately two to 7% of cases. And less common but equal concerning is injury edema, which occurs in less than 1% of patients, but requires immediate attention. So to mitigate these risks, advanced imaging techniques like CT perfusion and MRI are becoming increasingly valuable. So understanding the risk and rewards is pivotal in thrombolytic therapy. Now let's explore another uh, tool in our um, uh, treatment uh, journey, so which is the mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, let's just move. To, let's just skip this slide and move to um, the third slide on th on um, uh, before we move to mechanical thrombectomies. I'd, I'd I'd like to just talk about the trials which were done in uh, thrombolytic therapy. So the developments in thrombolytic therapy. Um, good. So so building on the rich history of thrombolytic therapy we find ourselves amidst an exciting array of recent advancement that are influencing our clinical decisions today. So in the, um, the NOR test trial of 2017, 64% of patients treated with tenecteplase achieved favorable outcomes. So here we talk about the modified ranking scale of zero to one at three months, compared to 63% of alteplase which is a statistic, statistical that question. Sorry? Mm -hmm. around, is someone talking? No, no, no. Somebody just uh, went off mute by mistake, but you're welcome to go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. And then the extend IATNK trial went further, reve revealing reperfusion rates of 22% for tenecteplase compared to 10% for alteplase. So shifting our gaze to a therapeutic window for TPA, pre preliminary results from the ongoing ECAS-4 trial point towards the possibility of extending treatments beyond the classic four and a half hour window. So the wake up trial brought MRI guided thrombolysis into the spotlight, showing that 53.3% of treated patients achieved favorable outcome at 90 days as compared to 41.8% in the placebo group. And then on the other hand, um, in terms of advancements, uh, we have the genomic medicine, which actually also holds promise, with preliminary studies suggesting that certain genetic markers may predict a patient's response to thrombolytic therapy, as well as their risk for hemorrhage. So now let's move on to some exciting other developments in the field. Um, that is on the next slide. Um, so these are the emerging uh, thrombolytic agents. So while the alteplase remains the gold standard, we are seeing some promising contenders in the pipeline aiming to push the boundaries of stroke treatment. Um, I already spoke about tenecteplase. Um, let's just go talk about the desmoteplase. Originating from vampire bed saliva is another fascinating candidate. Although it had mixed results in trials, it remains under further investigation. Retiplase, predominantly used for myocardial infarction, is also being explored for its applicability in stroke treatment. Staphylokinase, a bacterial-derived agent, is in the early stages of research and showing some promise. Uncrot, derived from Malaysian pit viper venom, is another agent under scrutiny. Previous studies have been inconclusive, but research continues on it. And then we have the Montivec, a factor 7A inhibitor, aiming to reduce the risk of hemorrhagic complications. However, it's also still in the early stages of trials. Last but not least, sonothrombolysis, a technique that employs ultrasound to augment the thrombolytic effect. It's, it's, it's also in its uh, experiment, experimental phase. All right, let's move to the next slide. So, so now let's talk about the current trends and challenges in uh, intravenous tissue plasminogen activator. So, so 
TPA is a very critical treatment for acute stroke, um, for acute ischemic stroke. Uh, currently administered to about 12% of such patients. That, these are statistics from the US. Uh, more or less, we are almost on the same percentage in SA. So the treatment rate, though an improvement due to factors like stroke centers, increased clinician training, and the rise of um, telestroke is, is still limited. So the primary issue is patients arriving too late for effective treatment. So to increase early arrivals, we need better community education regarding stroke symptom recognition and the importance of emergency calls. However, traditional education programs have shown limited success, signaling the need for novel strategies. One such strategy involves mobile stroke units capable of on-site treatment and shown to enhance um, uh, TPA treatment rates. Further, home telemedicine and early warning devices may play significant roles in the future. We must also address the noted disparities in TPA usage across sex, geographic location, socioeconomic sta uh, statuses, ethnicity, and race. So while uh, IV thrombolysis shows no efficacy variance ac across these groups, demographic groups, Usage rates are notably lower in rural, rural areas and among women, Black, and Hispanic populations. Therefore, a crucial objective is to understand and overcome these barriers to access and improve patient outcome. Can we move to the next slide? So, so as we venture beyond thrombolytic therapy, let's focus on a treatment that has been nothing short of revolutionary for ischemic stroke patients, which is the mechanical thrombectomy. Simply put, a mechanical thrombectomy is an endovascular procedure designed to remove a blood clot blocking a cerebral artery. It's especially critical for treating large vessel occlusion and for patients who may be ineligible for thrombolytic therapy. Several landmark trials have shaped our understanding and application of this procedure. Trials like Mr. Clean, Escape, and Dawn have made it a class one recommendation according to the latest ASA and AHA guidelines for selected patients with ischemic stroke. In today's clinical landscape, the importance of mechanical thrombectomy cannot be overstated. It's increasingly being integrated into the treatment pathways at comprehensive stroke centers. Furthermore, it often complements thrombolytic therapy in a multimodal approach to stroke management. So with this background, we are well prepared to dive into the history and latest advancements in mechanical thrombectomy. So as we transition from the, um, the thrombolytic therapy, it's enlightening to consider the journey mechanical thrombectomy has taken over the years. So the first attempt started um, with the Messi retriever in 2000 and 2004, followed by the Penumbra system in 2008. So these were the front runners, uh, yet the technology and efficacy have advanced considerably since then. So in 2014, the Mr. Clean trial was a game changer becoming the first study to, to show the efficacy of mechanical thrombectomy. So in this trial, functional independence improved by 13.5% compared to standard care. Hot on its heel, the ESCAPE trial in 2015 found that 53% of patients achieved functional independence, significantly better than the 29.3% in the control group. In recent years, the Dawn and the Diffuse 3 trials have continued to push the envelope. So the Dawn expanded the treatment window to 24 hours for selected patients, while the Diffuse 3 reported an impressive 78% reperfusion success rate. So this rapid uh, evolution reflects our growing understanding and technology advancements in stroke treatment. Next slide. So the field of um, mechanical thrombectomy is not static. It's continuously evolving. 
thanks to ongoing research and technological advancements. So speaking of newer uh, devices, uh, stent retrievers like Trevor and Solitaire have made procedures quicker and more efficient. Aspiration techniques, as seen in the ADAPT method, are also gaining traction. In terms of recent trials, the ISTAR trial uh, in 2017 has signif was significant sig was significant was significant because it compared aspiration techniques with stent retrievers and found both to be effective. So a study worth uh, watching is the tension trial, which is investigating the effectiveness of mechanical thrombectomy in distal arterial occlusions. Last but not least, we are seeing exciting advancement in technology. So things like artificial intelligence is now being utilized for patient selection and real-time flow dynamics monitoring is now is, is on the horizon, which could offer unpre, un, uh, 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 pre, pre, precedented insights into, into uh, um, during procedures. So now let's let's move to the next slide. Um, so Let's, let's pivot from our discussion on the history and fundamentals of stroke therapy to look at some cutting edge developments that may reshape our clinical approach to acute stroke management. So as previously mentioned, until 2014, evidence supporting endovascular thrombectomy for LVOs was rather limited. So the landscape changed dramatically with Mr. Clean trial which in December 2014 became the first study to show significant benefits of EVT or endovascular therapy in patients with LVOs. So the existing guidelines have been largely shaped by this breakthrough. So the, the recommended uh, endovascular therapy in patients with um, occlusions, uh, with occlusions in the uh, MCA, ICA, and ACA, provided the occlusion occur occurred in the first tw uh, within uh, 24 hours. And so earlier this year, two pivotal studies were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. What set these studies apart in their focus on patients with larger infarct core is, is that um, um, these studies redefine what we understood as large vessel occlusion, shifting the focus from the traditional segments of MCA, ICA, and ACA. So both studies, indicated um, indicate favorable outcomes as per the 90-day modified ranking scale. Um, so it's, it's crucial to note that both studies were terminated early and were not blinded, which could skew the perceived benefits. So the studies are the ANGEL aspect um, study and the SELECT2 study. So the the, the, the one caveat with these two studies is um, they noted an increase in both symptomatic and asymptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. Um, so although these studies haven't yet changed our clinical guidelines, they are likely to have a significant impact on future research and treatment protocols. Um, let's, let's move to the next slide. So let's let's touch on the, an integrated approach to acute ischemic stroke management. So, um, so patient selection, so obviously the criteria for choosing, choosing between thrombolytic therapy, mechanical, throm uh, mechanical thrombectomy, or both is based on eligibility criteria. So TELUS is key. So, Importance of the golden hour in stroke management is very, very important. So especially in patients receiving the thrombolytic therapy. Um, and also uh, other key factors are the bridging therapy. So these are patients who previously re uh, received tissue plasminogen act act activator who would then qualify for mechanical thrombectomy. Um, so the role of multidisciplinary team, including neurologists, neuroradiologists, and emergency physicians is really, really key in treating these patients. Let's move to the next slide. So as we dive deeper into stroke management, we need to understand that no man is an island. The same holds true for effective stroke care. 
So it requires a coordinated multidisciplinary approach known as the stroke system of care. In this um, in the organized systems, every aspect from early recognition of stroke symptoms to rapid transport and effective treatment is optimized to provide the best patient outcomes. There are different levels of stroke sensors, each with specific capabilities. So we have the primary stroke center, for example, which have um, an acute stroke teams with available imaging and they are capable of administering TPA. And then we have the comprehensive stroke sensors, which offer more advanced services such as advanced imaging techniques, endovascular procedures, and they often have a neuro ICU for more severe stroke patients. So thrombectomy capable stroke sensors are a third category. They provide thrombectomy 24 seven, which is a vital service for patients with large vessel occlusion. Last but not least, we must acknowledge the critical role of emergency medical services. So collaboration with EMS ensures rapid identification and transport of stroke patients to the most suitable center. So by understanding and integrating these systems of care, we can ensure that our patients receive the most appropriate and timely uh, care for their individual needs. Next slide. So treating stroke does not end. Um, it does not end after the initial emergency treatment. In fact, for most patients, the journey has just begun. The next stage is post-stroke care and rehabilitation, which is essential for maximizing recovery and enhancing patients' quality of life. A multidisciplinary team typically guides post-stroke care and rehabilitation. This team can include physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, nurses, neurologists, and psychologists. Each professional has a unique role, providing comprehensive care that addresses the various needs of stroke patients. So the goal of rehabilitation is to enhance patients' independence, improve functional outcomes, reduce complications, and ultimately improve quality of, care, of life. This involves various elements, such as physical therapy for motor skills, occupational therapy for daily activities, speech therapy for communication and emotional support to address the psycho psychological impact of stroke. Additionally, educating patients and caregivers about the condition, ongoing care, and ways to prevent future strokes is crucial. So rehabilitation usually begins as soon as the patient is stable often within 24 hours to 48 hours after the stroke. It is a continuous process that may last months to years, depending on the severity of the stroke and individual patient characteristics. The rehabilitation plan is continuously adjusted according to the patient's progress, need, progress and needs. Um, so the next slides, um, I, I have two cases. Um, that um, um, we can perhaps maybe discuss. Um, our first case involves Emily, um, a 72-year-old woman on anticoagulants for atrial fibrillation. So she presents with sudden onset um, hemiparesis and confusion. Her INR comes back elevated, which presents a dilemma. The dilemma here is she's a high risk for hemorrhages, for hemorrhage if given thrombolytic. What will be your approach in this scenario? So let's just uh, discuss the uh, discussion points based on this case. Starting with balancing the risk of hemorrhage, hemorrhage against the benefit of decanalization. Studies like the IST3 trial indicate that the risk of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhages increases with the use of TPA, TPA in patients with elevated INR, especially here we we're looking at INR above 1.7. So this was an uh, IST3 study from 2012. Alternative, uh, the second point is to discuss alternative approaches like mechanical thrombectomy in this case. So can, can mechanical thrombectomy be implemented or not? So a meta-analysis published in JAMA 
showed that mechanical thrombectomy has a better safety pro profile in terms of hemorrhagic transformation compared to TPA alone. And then the last point is how to manage anticoagulants in acute stroke setting. So guidelines from the American Heart Association suggest rapid reversal of anticoagulation using prothrombin complex concentrate, the PCC, if immediate thrombolysis is needed. Let's move to the next case. So our next case is um, Robert, a 58-year-old male who woke up with stroke symptoms including left-sided numbness, facial drooping, and slurred speech. The time of symptom on onset is unclear. CT perfusion scans show salvageable tissue. Then how would you navigate this scenario consider considering that the timeline for thrombo thrombolis thrombolytics is uncertain? So discussion points here is the role of advanced imaging like CT perfusion in wake-up strokes. So the wake-up trial showed that MRI-guided, uh, um, sorry, CT perfusion uh, is safe and effective for patients with wake-up strokes or strokes of unknown onset time. Um, this um, with but this So can I just check if everyone can still hear me? I think we've lost Dr. Ngele. Um, can everyone still hear me? Yes, okay, thank you. Um, thanks so much. Okay, I think we've lost Dr. Ngele, so I'm just going to give it a minute. If you just give me a minute, um, just to see, I think he might have load shooting on his side. So let's just give it a minute. Thank you. We are just having some mild connectivity issues, um, but Dr. Ngela will be back online shortly.
Okay, Sorry. yes, we've got you. No worries, you're back online. <laughs> right. Let's see. Okay, good. Um, I, 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 I guess we were on the second case. Uh, yeah, of, correct. And I was just discussing the pointers there. Um, I was discussing the role, I discussed the role of advanced imaging like CT perfusion in wake up strokes. Um, I've, um, I've also discussed the risk and the benefit analysis of thrombotic, uh, thrombolytic therapy. And then um, lastly, the me mechanical thrombectomy is a potential option. I think I was on the mechanical thrombectomy. So the DAWN trial actually demonst demonstrated the effectiveness of mechanical clinical thrombectomy six to 24 hours from the last known world time when there was a mismatch between the clinical deficits and infarct volume. Um, I think we can move on to the next slide um, on preventive strategies. So while acute treatment and rehabilitations are vital, prevention shall always be our primary goal. Preventive strategies not only reduce the risk of initial stroke, but also of stroke recurrence in those who have already had one. These strategies range from lifestyle changes to appropriate medication use, encouraging patients to adopt a healthy diet, engage in, in regular physical activity, quit smoking, and consume, and, uh, consume alcohol moderately can significantly reduce stroke risk. We also need to control key risk factors such as hypertension, sugar diabetes, high cholesterol, and atrial fibrillation. This often involves medication use, including antiplatelet drugs, anticoagulation for patients with AF, and statins for cholesterol management. In certain cases, more specialized intervention may be needed, needed such as carotid endarterectomy and stenting for patients with significant carotid artery stenosis. Um, let's, uh, we can skip, all right, let me, let me, let me just, uh, let's just go to the future therapies in stroke care. All right. So, um, as previously said, just in closing, uh, that stroke management is not a static field and we constantly strive to innovate and develop more effective therapies. So let's explore some promising developments on the hor horizon. First, we have neuroprotective agents. These are drugs designed to shield the brain from injuries after a stroke. They can work in multiple ways, such as reducing inflammation or decreasing apoptosis. That is the, the, the process of program cell death. Some potential agents under investigation, investigation include uh, libentlamine, uh, minocycline, and NXY059. Next, we turn our attention to stem, stem cell therapy. Stem cells, due to their ability to differentiate into a variety of cell types, may help in recovery after a stroke. Multiple clinical trials are ongoing to assess the safety and efficacy of these therapies. So the field of personalized medicine is also showing potential in stroke management. So with advancements in genomics and molecular biology, we may be able to tailor treatments to an individual's unique genetic profile. Um, already I've spoken about the endovascular treatments, which are in the, where the research is currently and the innovation is currently. The development of advanced clot retrieval devices and further refinement of thrombotic agents may improve the efficacy. So new software and technologies are being developed to aid in the early detection of stroke, to provide accurate assessment of brain injury and guide therapeutic strategy. Lastly, artificial intelligence could have a significant impact, impact on stroke care with potential applications ranging from rapid image analysis for predicting patient outcomes, identifying at-risk patients, and even guiding rehabilitation strategies. It's important to remember that these therapies are still largely in research or clinical trial stage and are not yet standard care for stroke patients. However, they represent exciting potential advancements in our fight against stroke and give us hope for the future.
So we've covered a lot of ground today uh, from the evolution of throm thrombolytic therapy to the state of the art in mechanical thrombectomy. So the takeaway message is clear, time is brain. And an integrated multidisciplinary approach is crucial for optimizing patient's outcome in acute stroke treatment. So as we look forward, the future is full of promising innovations that have the potential to make our treatment protocols even more effective. Whether it's uh, through advanced imaging technologies, telemedicine, or even robot-assisted procedures, the future of stroke is bright. I'd like to thank you all for your attention and engagement throughout this presentation. I'm now open for any questions. Thanks so much, Atengeli. Yeah, so we've opened up the floor for, for questions. Uh, there's a question that has come through here. So the question is asking um, your opinion on the management of stroke six to 24 hours after onset, um, the place of um, large risk occlusion and MRI, MRA or MRI, and then lastly, criteria for patient selection for EVT. All right, so with um, the six to 24 hours, so um, those pa patients benefit from mechanical thrombectomy. So that is based on the DON and the diffuse three trials, which were done in this group of patients. And obviously these patients have to be eligible for the mechanical thrombectomy. So you're looking at the infarct core size. Here we're looking at less than 70 mils. Um, and also on, um, on um, a CT scan, you can do the aspect score, uh, which then uh, usually patients with aspect score of less than six can benefit from it. What's the second question? Sorry. So the second part of that question was then the, the criteria of... Um, Criteria for patient selection for, for EBT. For endovascular um, uh, uh, endovascular therapy. All right, yes. so, um, so firstly, I mean, it has to be a large vessel occlusion. Um, uh, and here we are looking at the internal carotid artery, the ACA and the MCA. Um, as highlighted in the presentation that um, the, um, the, the ASPECT study and the SELECT-2 study, actually they um, focus on patients with more distal uh, occlusion of, the, um, of, of these large arteries. Um, however, the, patient, the current protocol um, uh, recommends that a patient needs to have um, um, a, an LVO, uh, either of the MCA, ACA, or, or ICA, uh, the on CT perfusion, um, the core size, the infarct core size, has to be less than seventy mils. Um, so typically, I mean, if we do CT perfusion that will show you the infarcted core in contrast to the salvageable penumbra, and you can calculate the ratio there, right? Uh, and that's part of the criteria. And as previously mentioned already, that you can also do the aspect score. Um, with the, which with which then recommends that it should be less than six points. Um, those are the patients who are eligible for therapy, and all, obviously the time frame. So it has to be below uh, twenty four hours. Can be beyond twenty four hours. And Thank what was the um, I'm just keeping an eye on the chat here. I'm not seeing. Any other questions come through? All right, no, we're not seeing any other questions come through. So thank you so much for that, Dr. Ngele. And um, thank you for that. Uh, wait, there is one question. Please advise management of wake up stroke in level one. Um, I'm assuming that will be a yes. So, so with level one hospital, so two things that can be done can do an MRI, uh, looking at the DWI flare mismatch, right? Uh, however, level one, <laughs> they I don't think they do have access to an MRI neuroimaging. So ideally, what they can do, um, if there is uh, a close stroke center close by. 
they can just transfer the patient there. Um, it, it has to be within the time frame because if it's beyond that, the benefit is, is very minimal. So uh, with a wake up stroke, you need to determine if there is, um, if, if there is either on MRI, DWI, flare mismatch, or if um, um, the, the, you look at the penumbra and the infarct core ratio, um, then you, you, then the patient will be eligible. But it's, it's gonna be very difficult because they don't do CT perfusion in level one hospitals. They don't, also don't do MRI. They don't have, I don't think they have access to MRI there. So they can easily just transfer a patient to either a tertiary or quaternary hospital. Thanks for that. And the question on patients that are on dialysis and taking warfarin, do we have different anticoagulant or um, we increase the strength? Sorry, what's the question? So the question is asking patients that are on dialysis and taking warfarin, is there a different uh, anticoagulant that they can use or do we increase the strength? Um, in patients with what? With a stroke who are on... Yes. Okay. okay, so, I mean, in terms of anticoagulants, there are other options, uh, the likes of the, the direct oral anticoagulants, uh, which uh, minimizes the effort of having to do INR monit monitoring. And you really have a rapid onset of action, uh, and it can be actually uh, beneficial in these patients. Uh, since, well, studies have shown that the risk of bleed in these patients with uh, on DOAX is uh, less in, in, in comparison to patients on warfarin. So, yeah, DOAX is, is, is an alternative to patients who are on warfarin. Thank you. And there's a question about the um, the, the the incidence of stroke. Um, if you could just expand on the, the incidence of stroke in South Africa. Um, what about the incidence of stroke? So just a question around the the, the yeah the what the the, the 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 stroke incidence is in South Africa and the the, the figures um, the the. The three hundred and sixteen, I think, in a hundred thousand. Okay, so there were there was a study which was done um, that was in twenty sixteen in South Africa, looking at the epidemiology of strokes in SA, and they found that the studies actually have shown that um, um, in approximately three hundred and sixteen uh, per hundred thousand population um, incidence of stroke in 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 South Africa. So that was in contrast to previous um, studies, which actually have shown that um, the numbers have actually increased in contrast to the previous studies. That is perhaps maybe probably due to uh, that advancement in diagnosis of patients with the strokes. Like now people are becoming more aware, more, more educated uh, about how to make, how to diagnose patients, patients with a stroke. Thank you. Um, and then there's a question here about a patient with hypertension and acute stroke. What is the acceptable uh, BP before starting thrombolytics? Okay, so before starting thrombolytics, the BP uh, shouldn't be more than 185 over 110. So 185 systolic and then 110 diastolic. Uh, but after giving the thrombolytic therapy, you, you need to make sure that the BP doesn't exceed 180 uh, or the, uh, systolic over 105 diastolic. So it needs to be below that. Okay, and I think this will be our last question for the night. Um, but then the question is um, to please explain the administration of thrombolytics in patients with an NIHSS of less than six. Are there studies which show therapeutic benefit? Oh, sorry, I think we might have lost Dr. Ngele again. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, load shedding is doing a little bit of a number on this side uh, of the year. So oh, there we go. Dr. Ngele, can you hear? There we go. Can you? Yeah. So did you did you manage to catch that last question? Uh, 
Hello? Okay, no, I think, yeah, we we have lost Dr. Singula again. Thank you so much all for your attention. I know we are at eight o'clock, so this is usually when we would end the talk. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and, and end the talk here. Um, we will um, again post the link on our YouTube channel. Um, the NetCare YouTube channel has the links to all the previous talks. So please feel free to visit the YouTube channel. Um, the talks that we're currently doing now, as well as previous talks that we've held over the past few years are available on that YouTube channel for viewing. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for your time and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you.